my next plan video as well again taking too, too long i like to get some content out i also noticed that a lot of the video ended up being taken up by explaining who certain people are so to avoid that issue in the future i'm going to produce these shorter biographical videos over various important but lesser known figures uh for people who live into the 30s or later i don't plan on covering their whole life um things that happen post-revolution that's really what my main videos are for um, if someone does die during the Civil War, I will probably cover their whole life. For example, when I plan to cover Yakov Sverdlov. For this video, almost the whole thing is being pulled from Sheila Fitzpatrick's The Commissariat of Enlightenment, um, which in the future I do plan to do a full video under the Commissariat under Lunacharsky. Anatoly Vasilievich Lunacharsky was born in Poltova, Ukraine in 1875. His mother was married to a civil servant, Vasily Lunacharsky, where his biological father was Alexander Ivanovich Antonov, a civil servant with radical views. Lunacharsky and his mother lived with Antonov until Antonov's death. He would then go to the first Kiev gymnasium. While there, he joined a Marxist revolutionary circle. When he graduated, he was told he would have a very low chance of being able to go to a Russian university because of his membership in that circle. This caused him to persuade his mother to let him go sur study at the University of Zurich. There, age nine, he met Plekhanov, the father of Russian Marxism. Lunacharsky was deeply interested in philosophy, especially that of Rich Richard of Venerys, who was an opponent to materialism and Lunacharsky's teacher at the university. He eventually came more to fight with Plekhanov, who he determined to neglect the emotional and ethical side of scientific socialist ideology. In 1898, Lunacharsky made his return to Russia, where he joined a social democratic group in Moscow, which was organized by Anna Ulyanova, Lenin's older sister. Whilst in this group, he was arrested, and then exiled to Vologda, where he was in company of various Marxists. Here is where he grew close to Alexander Bogdanov, who was also a fan of Venerus's philosophy. Lunacharsky would go on to marry Bogdanov's sister. During this time as well, he studied myth and the history of religion. After being released from exile, he went abroad and met with Lenin. In 1904, Lunacharsky would join the Bolsheviks alongside Bogdanov. Lunacharsky wrote of his relationship with the other Bolsheviks, My whole outlook, and indeed my whole character, did not incline me for a moment towards half-hearted commitments, compromise and obscuring of the bright minimalist basis of fully revolutionary Marxism. Of course, between me on the one hand and Lenin on the other, there was a great similarity. He approached all these questions as a practical man with enormously clear grasp of tactics, a real political genius. I approached him as a philosopher, and I will say more definitively, as a poet of the revolution. While abroad, a member of the party was expected to engage in ruthless polemics with the Mensheviks, which he did out of party duty. However, he tried to remain friendly with many Mensheviks up through the revolution. He spent much of this time in his life heavily interested in art and religion. He was interested in them because he wanted to create an emotional and ethical counterweight to Plekhanov's rationalism, which was the majority position of the Bolsheviks. To advance this point of view, Lunacharsky wrote Religion and Socialism, one volume published in 1908 and another would be published in 1911. This work has never been translated, and a bit of searching, I didn't even, I couldn't even find the second volume in Russian uh, to try and run through uh, a translator app. Um, but going off other people's descriptions, here's what it was about. That Engels and Plekhanov ignored Marx's emotional and ethical commitment to socialism. That Marx was a moral philosopher in the Jewish tradition of Christ and Spinova. He also felt if Bolshevik propaganda remained purely materialistic and scientific, it could only appeal to the proletariat and would not gain emotional sympathy of the intelligentsia or the peasantry. He felt that Bolsheviks should propagate Marxism as anthropogenic religion, that it should set man as being God, the idea that God-building was also taken up by Maxim Gorky, who was friends with Lunacharsky. He wrote Confession in 1908. It tells the story of a pilgrim who meets many false prophets but he finds a true prophet who directs him to join a commune, the basic idea being that togetherness and collective identity with other humans was the new god. Lenin had been avoiding making this a party issue despite his opposition to it, but Bogdanov was becoming a major political figure. At, the, at this time, there was a debate within the Bolshevik party about participation in the Duma and general participation in legal activity. Lenin took up the side of participating in the Duma and other legal activities, where Bogdanov was opposed so Lenin wrote Materialism and Empiro Criticism in 1908, primarily directed at Bogdanov, but as well as the ideas of this anti-materialist philosophical wing of the party, which included Lunacharsky. In 1909, Lunacharsky, with Gorky and Bogdanov, set up a party school, which was to train new leaders from the working class. Students would be smuggled out of Russia to go to the school. Members from various social democratic groups were invited, but neither the Mensheviks nor the Bolsheviks accepted the idea that the party school was really interfactional. It was considered to be run by a dissident group of Bolsheviks trying to increase their power in the party and within Russia. Lunacharsky admitted in his memoirs that this accusation was not without some foundation. 
Before the school was created, its supporters broke with the Bolsheviks and formed a separate group. They liked the common program, though many opposed Lenin's plan to participate in the Duma. The school had 13 students. Lenin criticized the school in letters, and his attack succeeded in splitting off of five of the students. Under this pressure, the group began to split. Maxim Gorky would drift back to Lenin. Part of this was caused by Gorky's wife feuding with Anna Lunacharskaya, the sister of Bogdanov and Lunacharsky's wife since 1902. Even though Gorky and Lunacharsky were not part of this dispute, they remained estranged from each other for almost a decade. A second school was opened in Bologna between 1910 and 1911. Gorky did not participate in this one. The group invited members from all the Russian Social Democratic factions and was funded by some expropriations carried out in the Urals. Lenin and Plekhanov were invited but refused. Trotsky accepted. After this, however, the group disintegrated. Bogdanov returned to Russia in 1913. Gorky and Lenin reestablished their friendships. They made comments on Lunacharsky's scientific mysticism, and Lenin was reported to have called Lunacharsky a charlatan. A student for this school ended up being an agent provocateur for the Okrata, the Tsar's secret police. They made a report of the school. A description of this report is in the Prophet Armed. The report says that the lecturers, Lunacharsky, Menshinsky, Kolontai, and Pokrovsky behaved towards their pupils, clandestine workers from Russia, in a haughty and patronizing manner. Trotsky exceptionally entertained friendly and private relationships with his pupils. Following the collapse of this group, Lunacharsky moved to Paris. With the outbreak of war, Lunacharsky took up the internationalist position and, be and began to wrote for Nashe Slovo. Nashe Slovo began circulating in January of 1915. Its chief organizer was Vladimir Antonov Avsenko, future secretary of the Military Revolutionary Committee, one of the primary organizers of the October Revolution. He also invited Julius Martov, Lenin's old friend from the Iskra days, and Leon Trotsky. The paper very quickly became Trotsky's, which quickly led him to conflict with Martov with Lunacharsky often playing the peacemaker between them. In 1915, Lunacharsky would move to Switzerland, and from his memoirs, I at once presented myself to Lenin and Zinoviev with the proposal of the fullest union. This would be his reconciliation with Lenin, though he would remain not a member of the Bolsheviks for now. In May of 1917, he would return to Russia on the second sealed train with many other Russian social democrats, mostly Mensheviks. He, like many other revolutionaries, would end up arrested during the July days. While in prison, he rejoined the Bolshevik party. After his release, he was elected as the Bolshevik candidate to the deputy mayor of Petrograd. During the Kornilov affair, he made a motion that both Kornilov and the provisional government be declared counter-revolutionary, and a government of workers and peasants be created. He became the president of the Cultural Education Commission of the Petrograd Party Committee. During this time, he became a very popular speaker, speaking at various factories, barracks, and other mass meetings. He would go on to play a major role in the Second All-Russian Congress when it came time to select the commissars. He would be chosen to head the Commissariat of Education. I want to share a quote of how Lenin felt about Lunacharsky, as recorded by Viktor Shulgin in 1920. When Lunacharsky had not carried out Lenin's instruction, I said to Vladimir Ilyich reproachfully, Are you still fond of him? Lenin then replied, and the reply was so unexpected that I wrote it down then and there, and I advise you to also be fond of him. He is drawn towards the future with his whole being. That is why there is such joy and laughter in him, and he is ready to give joy and laughter to everyone. Of course, in this case, he has been foolish. He should not have got himself mixed up in Bogdanov's net, but we'll pull him out of it. I hope you like this sort of video. Let me know down in the comments. I think this works well to provide backgrounds to various persons who will come up in the main series of videos. I hope to have my next video up soon, which is about the Second All-Russian Congress. Uh, mostly for thematic reasons, I want to release it in October, considering it takes place during the Revolution. I actually have it mostly written, and I have a few days off for my main job this week, so it should be doable. And as always, like, share, and subscribe.